Mississippi's at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. They are using everything from small garden tools to a giant excavator, but search crews with the Bear County Sheriff's Office have not been able to find the remains of 38-year-old Curtis Perry, which they believe may be at a home in the 300 block of Home Green. That's in East Bear County. That's after BCSO officials went there to arrest 17 year old Derek Salisi for allegedly committing several violent offenses, and they discovered evidence indicating Perry's remains may be nearby. Our Devin Clark joins us live at the scene where that search continues for the second evening. Now, Devin, are they making progress? Well, Steve, it is really hard to tell how much progress they are making, but I can tell you the scene right now, very quiet. That does not mean crews are not at work, though. If you take a look, you can actually see that giant excavator that you mentioned. It is digging up dirt, and it is digging up dirt carefully and meticulously. We understand that that dirt is being sifted through something like how an archaeologist would do. We know that crews are going to be combing this entire acre and a half lot hoping to find Perry's remains or evidence indicating that his remains are elsewhere. Sheriff Javier Salazar wouldn't say exactly what led he and his team to believe that Perry's body may be buried here, but the evidence was compelling enough for BCSO to summon numerous crews to the area to search. Now, this all began yesterday when BCSO officials tried to arrest Salisi here for alleged violent offenses, and though they weren't able to apprehend him, officials say they found stolen vehicles, stolen guns, and what's been described as a narcotics enterprise. They also found evidence that Perry's remains may be on the property. Now, Perry, who we now know is from Philadelphia, was last seen in July on surveillance video being chased in the Foster Road area. Perry's cell phone and rental car riddled with bullets also found on Foster Road. Now that evidence is tying Perry's disappearance to this east side home, Salazar says they will work the scene for the entire five days that they were allowed to in an effort to get answers. One of the other uh, resources that we brought to bear today was we've actually got some, some game wardens out here that are assisting us with cadaver dogs. Uh, yesterday we brought out a civilian uh, uh, organization that, that they were the only cadaver dog available. Uh, they didn't give us very much, but today uh, we brought out a couple of canine units from the state police in hopes that maybe they'll give us uh, uh, more results. And we know that Celici is wanted on at least three felony warrants. If anyone out there has any information on his whereabouts or if anyone has any information on Perry's whereabouts, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers at number 210-224-STOP. Reporting live on the east side, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, Devin. Pope Francis becoming even more tolerant in his views on homosexuality. Yeah, he made statements in a documentary released today at the Rome Film Festival supporting same-sex civil unions. Paul Venema with what the Pope said and reaction from local Catholics. In a documentary called Francisco, Pope Francis discussed the issue of same-sex civil unions and homosexuality. Homosexual people have the same right to be in a family. They are children of God, the Potter said, according to the film. We found most Catholics we spoke with in agreement. We're all different. We all have different ways of how we are. And I think that that should all be respected and acknowledged. Though for some, the issue of homosexuality seemed to be a struggle. I believe that everyone has the right to love one another. However, um, according to the word of God, that is not acceptable. In the documentary, the Pope also addressed same-sex civil unions, saying what we have to have is a civil union law. That way, they are legally covered. Everyone is entitled to their human rights as well as civil. Uh, but according to the word of God, I let God handle that one. <laughs> Juan Espinoza said he supports same sex. To avoid a crashed motorcycle laying in the middle of the road. Deputies later found that motorcyclist dead not too far down the road from where his bike was found. It's still unclear what caused the crash. The victim's identity has not yet been released. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf touting the county's efforts to help the small business community through the pandemic in his State of the County address today. The county has set aside more than 16 million for businesses since March. Not all of that is spent. And Garrett Berger talks with two businesses who hope to get some of that money. 
Since the early days of the pandemic, Bear County has been dedicating money to help small businesses. We've helped out 100, 850 so, so far. With money to help more. Just yesterday, county commissioners approved a new program specifically for bars and restaurants. Tony G's Soul Food plans to go for a piece of that money. And the VP of its ownership group sees that kind of targeted help as critical for the city. Folks are needing to work. Folks are needing to get back out there. And I think that's going to be key. He says while Tony G's has been getting through the pandemic, it hasn't been without hardship. We didn't have enough bodies. We had to, we had to let people off. That was a tough deal. But if there's no revenue coming in. It's not just bars and restaurants feeling the squeeze. Janie Villarreal McClinchy had to shutter her gallery, K Retro Arts, and get a new job. Though she's keeping her business going as best she can without a permanent location. And then the idea came like, well, you know, we can't get together, but how about I bring the painting party to you? So then the whole idea of, hey, let's create a painting party kit to go. A new round of county funded grants through the Maestro Entrepreneur Center could help her get back in business full time. Um, she's not sure if she'll apply, uh, concerned about a second wave of the pandemic. It just it makes me unsure because I don't know what if I do open and what if I get into the same situation. But she's glad it's an option. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. As a record number of people are mailing in their ballots for the upcoming election, we were wondering just how long does it take to get mail to, from point A to point B in the same city? Let's say San Antonio, for instance. So we tested the postal. And staying with his daughter because his house with, uh, was unlivable. Jesse Degollado now with a plan to help this 94-year-old war hero. I gotta help. The house that for so many years had been Alfred Guerra's home has been gutted. It's nothing more than an empty shell. It's going to be very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Once we finish it, right? His family had tried to do what they could. One project back to another project and another project and then another project. But after Guerra's son passed away, it became too much for them. Yet now, we're two purple hearties right here. Huh? <laughs> Tony Roman was wounded in Vietnam. Guerra while fighting in the Philippines, where he also earned a bronze star in World War II. The former commander of the local military order of the Purple Heart is among those who are coming to Guerra's rescue. It's what we do as veterans, as, as uh, combat warriors, we leave nobody behind. Especially other veterans like Alfred Guerra in situations like this. It's not a lost cause, it can be done, it just needs a, a lot of work and... A plan on how to proceed and how to pay for what needs to be done is now in the works with the city of San Antonio's help. His daughter says her 94-year-old father's memory isn't what it used to be, but when it comes to repairing the home that he yearns... I'll never give up easy. <laughs> That's one thing I, I learned from my grandpa. My grandpa was a blacksmith. If all goes as hoped, the blacksmith's grandson who came back a war hero could be home by Christmas. All I want to see is a good smile on his face and make him happy. That's all. Yeah. Well, as long as I'm with my family, I'm always happy. <laughs> Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. And we now know what the city is doing to help rebuild Mr. Guerra's home. Its Department of Human Services also is working with VFW Post 76 that will take the lead to coordinate what needs to be done. We have more about this joint effort underway on our website at ksat.com. I want to see him in his house. <laughs> you bet. Time saver traffic right now. This is 281 at Winding Way, and there are no major traffic troubles to tell you about at this hour. Look outside with live cam. Meantime, 87 degrees out there and more of the same today, Adam. Yeah, you know, I was just typing that into the uh, push alert I'm about to send out. More <laughs> of the same today and even into tomorrow, but we do have a couple of cold fronts to talk about. So today we were back up near 90 degrees, 89 the high temperature, and the average this time of year is 81. Right now we're still well into the 80s, even at 90 in Holotus, 83 though Canyon Lake, 89 New Braunfels, 88 Port SA and Castroville now at 89 degrees. Even a few stray showers out there far east of San Antonio, Lavaca County just got clipped by a few brief showers. This is part of that 10% that we've been talking about. Same story tomorrow, 10% chance. This evening though, partly cloudy, those showers coming to a quick end. Increasing humidity and low clouds developing overnight tonight and leading to a little bit of drizzle tomorrow morning, the 90 and sunny by the afternoon. We'll talk about the two cold fronts coming right up. COVID patients in the hospital right now, which is up 11 from yesterday and includes 35 new COVID-19 related admissions.
We have 19 patients in the ICU and 43 patients on ventilators. The mayor asked me to remind you that the city of San Antonio, along with several workforce nonprofits, is offering free workforce training and education to San Antonio residents who have been negatively affected by the COVID-19 pandemic in the hardest hit industries of hospitality, food service, and retail. Qualified participants are eligible to receive stipends of $15 an hour for actual time spent in an approved training program for a career in high paying industries such as healthcare, manufacturing, and information technology. Wraparound and support services such as help with childcare are also available. If you would like more information about these services, you can call 311 between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday through Friday to get connected to one of our training partners. And now I'm going to turn it over to the judge. Yeah, thanks, Colleen. Uh, you know, I lost my perfect attendance button, I don't know, so a couple months ago, I guess, <laughs> but now the mayor's lost his. For good cause, though, he needs to be up in Washington. There are several significant... Uh, uh, things that are pending with the Pentagon, certainly the space thing, and he needs to be up there. And uh, I'm proud that he's up there representing San Antonio and helping to bring some of those jobs uh, to our community. But just a real quick um, update on voting. Uh, we're still getting good turnouts. I think we'll vote over, well, I know we'll vote over 30,000 again today. Uh, and tomorrow, uh, be on the lookout for 18 new voting sites that will be released for election day, bringing it from 284 sites up to 301, I think it is. Uh, we still have these six extra days of early voting, so uh, with those six, six extra days and mail-in ballot already, it's going to be uh, you know, a huge turnout. Uh, the mail-in ballot, again, is a very safety measure, and I want to remind everybody that uh, if they're if, uh, requesting one, you still can do that. And you have to be able to, if you're 65 and older, you're going to get it right away. But you also uh, can request it if you believe you have a health issue that makes it dangerous for you to go there. States prohibited us from using COVID as a uh, reason not to go to the polls. But if you have a health condition and you think that precludes you, you still have a right to do that. Now, we have 69,000 people or ballots that we've got right now. Uh, we think we'll have 95 for it's over with. So they've taken the precaution to bring in the ballot. Uh, we started uh, matching today uh, the uh, uh, ballots with uh, their signature when the application and on the ballot. Uh, we've gone through 11,000 of them that we approved just today. We've had seven uh, that were rejected. We're reviewing those and we will try to contact the voter uh, to tell them if they're rejected, and so we're working hard on that. They won't start counting those early uh, mail-in ballots till I think it's October the 31st uh, when they do it. Things are changing in medicine uh, with respect to COVID, and I think it's going to be here for a long, long time. Our hospital district, which is the university hospital system, uh, through uh, September, uh, we've done 110,000 telemedicine calls that enables a person to get it, all the advice they need over the telephone or over uh, Zoom or whatever video there might be without having to come in. And again, that's another protection uh, from COVID. That's going to be something that's going to be a lot uh, with us for a long, long time. And so those of you that, uh, you know, go to a doctor or whatever, don't forget, you can use telemedicine and that will help save a trip to the office, help uh, and, and the spread of COVID by not having to uh, not having to go to the offices. So uh, we're working hard to expand telemedicine to uh, to to uh, protect everybody. So uh, that's what's going on here. All right, <laughs> thank you, Judge. As always, subscribe to the latest COVID nineteen updates by texting COSAGOV to five five zero zero zero. Get more information at COVID nineteen dot Antonio dot gov. I want to apologize to getting to that briefing a little bit late. Uh, the numbers that you missed from Dr. Colleen Bridger, who is filling in for Mayor Ron Nuremberg, who is in Washington, D.C. today to talk about some of the missions of the uh, military bases in town. Uh, Dr. Colleen Bridger is the interim director of Metro Health. 213 new cases today, bringing the total of 63,807 cases, 170 
is the seven day average. And those numbers are up, um, you know, it's somewhat from what we've seen lately. Usually it's been under 200 for the local case count or the daily case count. Uh, again, two new deaths to report and um, the county judge there reminding people voting is still underway. And he did put out a reminder and an emphasis on the fact that if you feel like you do have a health condition that would prevent you from being able to get out and vote in person due to possible infection from COVID, you can request a mail in ballot. You can still get one. Uh, it's not too late to do that. Right. Let's switch over to weather right now. Let's talk to Adam Kasky about just another one of those ditto days. <laughs> ditto day, yes, that's a good way to put it. And we're going to see a little bit more of that just for the next few days and then a couple of cold fronts will be affecting us. Take a look at temperatures out there right now. Still well into the 80s for most of us. 89 Pleasanton in New Braunfels, Honda Uvalde 88, 87 in San Antonio. And you look across the state, 80s, some locations at 90. But we go farther to the north and that's where it's really more winter like than it is fall like they've got snow on the ground and temperatures in the 30s across the northern tier and parts of the northland that colder air is likely to dislodge and push southward in the days ahead our first front is expected late on friday so the effects of, of it would mostly be felt on saturday morning in the 50s afternoon only in the 70s so saturday looking a little more comfortable and fall like than the heat returns on sunday in preparation for the next cold front early next week at some point Monday afternoon, Monday evening. And this one has the potential to be much stronger than the Friday cold front. The exact strength of it and the exact temperature drop is still up in the air. And it all depends on just how far south this front actually travels. Right now, there is some indications that it could get hung up near Laredo and Corpus Christi, and then we wouldn't cool off quite as much. You'd still notice it, but not as much as the potential. If this front decides to really march farther southward, we could see a much more significant temperature drop. And this is what we think the most likely scenario is right now. Near 90 Thursday, Friday, Friday, 70 Saturday, 90 again Sunday, and then we're down into the upper 60s potentially as we get on into Tuesday. Rain chance is still slim, about 30% with that front next week. Those temperatures looking good. Thanks, Adam. All right, will DeMar DeRozan be a San Antonio Spur next year? Larry, that is a question that is still very much up in the air. Yes, and we've already seen some reports in the past few months that DeMar DeRozan plans not to opt into his player option. We still don't know if that's true, but there's another report out there backing that up. Plus, in college football, how does Jeff Trailer feel about the first half of UTSA's season? We got it coming up. Well, first thing I think with anonymous sources, you, you never really can take them serious. Anonymous Cowboys players called out the staff for being unprepared, according to reports, but Sean Lee says you can't take them serious in big board sports. San Antonio guard DeMar DeRozan has a $27.7 million player option to stay with the Spurs, but it's being reported he wants out. According to the NBA staff at The Athletic, an anonymous NBA agent says DeMar doesn't want to be here, and if he goes, he'd like to join the Pistons and reunite with head coach Dwayne Casey from his Toronto days. DeMar joined the Spurs as part of the Kawhi trade in 2018. DeRozan is 31, and even if he opts into his contract, he's still one year away from free agency. And all football games at all levels for McCollum High School have been suspended for the next two weeks through November 4th per release from the Harlandale Independent School District. It states this is a precautionary measure of safety for students and staff after an individual at McCollum High School tested positive for COVID-19. Practices for all levels of football at McCollum High School will resume November 5th. McCollum was scheduled to face Buda Johnson Friday night. Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys linebacker Sean Lee is getting closer to making his 2020 regular season debut. Lee is a 10-year veteran, is coming back from core muscle surgery in early September. He's been dealing with the injury for months and hasn't practiced since the beginning of training camp. Today, he talked about his surgery and how he's feeling. I'm feeling great physically, and the hope is this week to be able to get out to practice. Um, do some things depending on, on what Britt and the trainers want me to do, but, but the hope is to get some indie work in and maybe work into some scout team 
Um, you know, the surgery was was tough. It was a core muscle surgery where they they had to reattach abs to my to my pelvic bone. So the first couple weeks were hard, but um, the last couple weeks I've made a lot of jumps and I feel great. Lee said he doesn't know how close he is to playing, but the hope is to practice, get into game shape, and help the team out sooner rather than later. Halfway through their 12-game regular season, UTSA is 3-3 three three overall, 1-1 one one in Conference USA, and every single game, though, has been competitive. First-year head coach Jeff Trailer was asked how he feels about his program compared to his expectations heading into his first campaign with UTSA. I'm very pleased uh, with the buy-in. You know, it, it's hard to change a culture, and that was our biggest objective for this year. Um, that we've, we've been in every single ball game. We've had a lot of unfortunate injuries. And we're, we're proclaiming that it's going to be all good luck from here on out. The seasons are like chapters, you know, in a book. Each, each game time its own chapter. And uh, chapter one was exciting. And we're in the, the plot. It's thickening right now in the middle of the book. And the best chapter of the book is still coming, JJ. Usually the best chapter is the last chapter. So that's what we're striving for. UTSA will host Louisiana Tech Saturday night at 7 at the Alamo Dome. The ninth meeting between the two sides. And I love Coach Trailer. That man is a quote machine. Very Getting very literary there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. I like that analogy. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. You got it. Our KSAT Q&A is coming up. In today's KSAP Q&A, we are joined as we are every Wednesday by San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg. But this week is a little different because the mayor goes to Washington. Mayor, thanks for being with us. Uh, let's talk about that trip first of all. You are headed to D.C. to the Pentagon. This is a trip that you make every year. But this one is unique because you are trying to position San Antonio to be the headquarters for U.S. Space Command. Tell us about that. Sure, yes, and San Antonio has been shortlisted after we reached out um, in response to uh, the call. We were also nominated by the governor uh, to be uh, potentially the new home for uh, U.S. Space Command consolidated uh, operations. So uh, we are shortlisted, and this is an opportunity with uh, very little distraction for us to go up and talk to uh, the decision makers who will be making a decision here in the next couple of months. Why do you think that San Antonio would be a good fit for that? You know, when a lot of people think about space operations, they think Houston or they think Florida. So what makes San Antonio the spot for that? You know, back in 1963, uh, then President uh, John F. Kennedy declared that the United States would throw its cap over the wall and conquer space here in our city, making a speech at Brook Air Force, Brooks Air Force Base. Uh, and that was in recognition of the great work that's been happening here from the very start in military aviation and the science and innovation that's happening uh, at our Air Force installations, uh, Southwest Research Institute, uh, Texas Biomed, the, the organizations that have been involved in exploration of the frontiers of mankind have been here in San Antonio. And so we have a, a definite role in space exploration as well as uh, in support of the American warfighter and all that goes back to the establishment of the U.S. Space Command originally in 1982 as a uh, function of the United States Air Force. Just like with everything else, uh, your trip is going to be affected and impacted by COVID. Uh, you, we, you make this trip every year, but you're meeting this time with military leaders on their response uh, to the pandemic. So what's the purpose of that meeting? Sure. Um, there has been a coordinated effort between the civilian communities and the Defense Department, along with uh, other agencies uh, from the state, federal and local levels. And of course, San Antonio has been involved in the coronavirus uh, response from the very beginning as a site for the evacuees that were moved out uh, of China. Um, we know our role in that evacuating American travelers. And so we have been coordinated with the Defense Department in many different aspects. Most recently, uh, the, uh, the uh, arrival of nurses, cohorts of uh, health professionals in the DOD to help supplement um, uh, the personnel here in South Texas, including in San Antonio. So we're going to go talk about the response uh, and see what's next with regard to the overall coordination at the Defense Department with regard to the COVID pandemic. 
And part of this mission for you going to Washington is something that you advocate for every time you meet with the Pentagon. We understand bringing more missions to Joint Base San Antonio. Uh, tell us a little bit about that effort and why it's something you continue to do. Sure. Um, there is uh, obviously a need for us on a continual basis uh, to protect the missions that we have here. Uh, to advocate for the San Antonio community with regard to the great coordination that we have had from the very start here in Military City USA. Everything that happens on the base uh, in some way, shape or form is affected by and affects um, our local community. And so we, we uh, are going up to talk a little bit about uh, those efforts. We're also um, have several different um, uh, proposals in for additional enhancements to the missions that are here, including uh, in the Air Combat Command. So uh, this is an opportunity for us to meet with some of the, you know, the decision makers, again, the higher ups, uh, generals of the Air Force will also be meeting with uh, Chief of Staff Brown, who was just named uh, head of the United States Air Force. So it's going to be a packed trip uh, in support of the current missions, but also the growth of the United States military presence here in our community. Let's switch gears just a little bit before we go and talk about uh, the elections coming up. Election day less than two weeks away right now. How are you feeling about uh, where the support may stand for those tax propositions that are on the ballot for San Antonio voters? I, I've been you know, overwhelmed by the response at the polls. Um, there has just been an incredible amount of uh, hope and optimism when you go out and see those lines and, and people you know, taking their civic duty uh, seriously. We're in the midst of a pandemic, but that is not stopping people from participating. And the response that we're getting with regard to helping our neighbors get back on their feet is positive. I think people understand um, the situation that we're in and that 154,000 of our neighbors and loved ones have found themselves uh, displaced from work or out of a job. And some many of those jobs, up to a third of them, won't come back again anytime soon. So it's an all in effort, as we have seen time and again during crises, that San Antonians are willing to stand up and, and support their neighbors in need. And that, of course, includes voting for Proposition B, which is essay ready to work. And for those watching this, if you haven't cast your ballot yet, we have a breakdown on our website at ksat.com explaining those tax propositions and what exactly you'll be casting your ballot for. Mayor Ron Nirenberg, as always, thanks for being with us and have a safe trip to D.C. Thank you, Mayor. We'll be right back. All these Zoom meetings and Google Classrooms creating an epidemic unrelated to coronavirus. Dry eye, the burning, tearing, blurry vision affects about 16 million people in the U.S., a number that's growing each day. Ursula Perry has details on a new wearable device that is giving dry eye sufferers immediate relief. Bill Casey always keeps his hands busy. I like to work around the house a little bit, always getting into something. But he couldn't find relief for his dry eye disease, and it could sometimes make his work environment uncomfortable. I'm an airline pilot, so oftentimes the, the cockpit environment is a little drier. In the environment that we're at, we want to have the, the best vision possible. The most common cause of dry eye is a blockage in the oil glands in the lid. So these are little oil glands. We if left untreated, it can make your eyes more susceptible to infections and have poor outcomes after eye surgeries. They'll just continue to go from mild stage to moderate stage to severe stage where they lose the glands completely. Then they become so symptomatic later that there are no treatments for them anymore. Now a device is helping dry eye sufferers find relief when eye drops won't work. It's called Tear Care. It's a wearable thermal device that goes over the eyelids. It heats up the oil glands to an optimized temperature, so, and then we actually express the glands and they become unobstructed. The procedure takes about 15 minutes plus prep time and patients can feel the effects right away. Before uh, the dry eye treatment, I was probably lubricating it up to, you know, maybe 10 times a day and after the treatment, maybe once or twice. The effects of tear care last about a year, but it's not covered by most insurance and it costs about $700 a session. The good news is a number of dry eye clinics that specialize in this have opened up in the San Antonio area and they're coming up with all kinds of new treatment via studies that are a lot less expensive. Ursula Perry, KSET 12 News.
All right, check this out. The first space station crew to launch during a pandemic returning to Earth tonight. NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy and two Russian cosmonauts launched to the International Space Station on April 9th, just weeks after the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. The crew is set to land at 9.55 p.m. in Kazakhstan. They spent 196 days in space at the ISS completing more than 3,000 orbits around the Earth and traveling 83 million miles. Guessing he's ready to be home. I would say so. Just a wild guess. <laughs> Not sure what the weather's like in Kazakhstan this year, time of year, but you know. It's a good question. Me neither. <laughs> I was going to say no that clue. face looks like, mm, I don't know. Nope. Yeah, don't ask me, Spreacher. I don't know. You can ask me, I won't have an answer for yeah, you right no, now. Yeah, no, I just It'd take me a little while to look into that one. I'm just thinking <laughs> out loud here, you know. That's okay. That's what we do around here, and <laughs> that's why we get along so well. All right, I want to take a look at the radar. We had a few showers pop up this afternoon, mainly Lavaca County just getting clipped by a few of those brief showers better than nothing. Earlier this morning, closer to Castroville, we had a few little streamers pop up and even in Bear County some spritzes, but that's it. And really, this is the 10% chance we've been talking about that we're going to continue to see for the next couple of days tomorrow and even on into Friday and then next week with another cold front. So one cold front expected Friday dry, another cold front and weather pattern change next week it could bring us a, sh a few showers, mainly a 30% chance. So about isolated in nature right now we're at 87 dew point is 60, so not uncomfortably humid out there, but the humidity is going to be rising through the night. 91 in Catula, still 89 New Braunfels, but lower 80s in the hill country. You look across the rest of the state, we're mostly in the 80s, still at 90 in a few spots, Del Rio and Laredo, but we're well above average here. You get way below average farther to the north. That's where temperatures are more winter like than they are fall like where they even have fresh snow on the ground and are about to get two more systems to move through that'll bring them more snow. Well, that colder air is going to start moving southward and our first cold front that hits us Friday afternoon, Friday evening, it'll affect us for Saturday, basically for one day more Saturday morning 50s by the afternoon will be in the 70s. Then the heat comes back into town back near 90 on Sunday. Then we get into Monday evening and the next cold front's going to arrive and that's going to have a bigger impact on our weather for Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. But there's a lot of question marks around this cold front and it mainly is how far south is it going to make it? These fronts tend to stall out in Texas or just south of us. And the big question is how far south will it make it if it gets way through San Antonio and Brownsville, then we'll be closer to the core of the cold air and our temperatures will drop off more significantly. But right now, the most plausible scenario is this will make it through San Antonio and then stall somewhere near Laredo toward Corpus Christi and we'll have a noticeable temperature drop, but not as significant as say that front was really progressive and pushing southward. So we're going to keep a close eye on it. And of course, we'll be fine tuning the forecast, but the most likely scenario right now is is this big temperature roller coaster near 90 Thursday, Friday, 70s on Saturday, 90 again Sunday, 80 Monday, and then we could be talking upper 60s for highs on Tuesday. So big changes, but of course, we'll be fine tuning those numbers as we get better information. So tomorrow morning, low clouds, that 10% chance still exists. 72 degrees in the morning, near 90 in the afternoon with that sunshine later on in the day. We pretty much do it all again on Friday, mid 80s for the most part. Saturday in the morning, we'll be in the mid 50s, afternoon 70s, lower humidity. Sunday, the humidity's back and temperatures are back near 90. Then that next cold front at some point late Monday, should have a bigger impact on our temperatures for Tuesday and Wednesday. The exact precise impact. We need a little more time yet to really pin down. All right, thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next.
Hi, good morning. It's Wednesday, October 21st. Thanks for joining us. New this morning, a person is dead after a motorcycle crash in South Bear County. They say they're still trying to figure out what led up to the crash. A driver called deputies saying they had to swerve to avoid hitting a motorcycle in the middle of the road. Deputies then found the motorcycle rider dead on the highway. San Antonio police looking into an assault on the northwest side. They say it happened around 1230 this morning. Police say a woman ran up to a victim and stabbed that victim in her stomach. However, they do not know what led up to the assault. That victim was taken to University Hospital and is expected to recover. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg is in our nation's capital today. He is meeting with members of the Pentagon to discuss the U.S. Space Command headquarters, among other topics. San Antonio is on a short list of potential locations to house that facility. During today's meeting, the mayor is also expected to talk about military medicine and cyber missions. Nuremberg says he also wants to address the local COVID-19 response and it has been greatly influenced by the military hospitals in our area. Additionally, the mayor plans on discussing bringing the 2022 Warrior Games to Military City USA. Officials say they found stolen vehicles, stolen guns, and what's been described as a narcotics enterprise. They also found evidence that Perry's remains may be on the property. Now, Perry, who we now know is from Philadelphia, was last seen in July on surveillance video being chased in the Foster Road area. Perry's cell phone and rental car riddled with bullets also found on Foster Road. Now that evidence is tying Perry's disappearance to this Eastside home, Salazar says they will leave no stone unturned. So tomorrow we'll start the day again with the low clouds and maybe a rogue sprinkle or a little bit of drizzle. 72 degrees in the morning, then by the afternoon, well, it's more of the same. Sunshine and right near 90, a southeasterly breeze at 5 to 10. And then there's a lot of ups and downs here in the forecast over the next several days. It's starting to look a little more fall-like. Starting with Saturday, we'll see a morning low of 55, then by the afternoon make it up to 75. So most of the day Saturday will be spent in the 60s and 70s with lower humidity. Then we warm to near 90 on Sunday, so we're on the upswing then. It's kind of a split weekend on the way. Then a stronger cold front likely late Monday, and that should make it feel more fall like by Tuesday and Wednesday with a slight chance of rain too. All right, thanks Adam. And thanks for watching the news at six. We'll see you back here on the night beat at 10. 68 on Tuesday, did I see that right? Yeah. Wow.